Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, Fundamentals. And uh, tonight we have uh, Larry uh, giving a talk. Uh, he's going to talk about time. And we know time is uh, important uh, in astronomy. It's uh, sort of how we relate to how far things are rather than by distance. And uh, it's how we relate to things in terms of we're not seeing them in the moment, but seeing them as it used to be. Uh, and Larry's going to kind of talk about these concepts. And uh, here we go. Thanks, Thank you. So I remember everybody, I remember very early on from way early childhood memories and uh, when time, uh, when a year seemed to last forever and the days were filled with wonder and going to places like Klopp Museums and the, you know, the uh, uh, Klopp Tower Inn in Rockford and uh, one of the most magical places like something right out of the movie The Time Machine, my next door neighbor, the Hollers, uh, where he had every possible kind of clock. At that time, it did, if he had digital clocks, it was not, uh, it was not uh, quartz. But anyway, he had every possible kind of timepiece you could imagine, and they were all very carefully set in synchronicity, so they would go off uh, simultaneously, and you'd hear all the chiming and everything. And that was a wonderful experience to a, a small person. There is not time, uh, there, there is not uh, going to be a, but limited experience tonight talking about larger spans of time, which we cover so much anyway in other subjects, and we'll hear so much about the seasons and the passage of the months and lunar time and solar time and so on and as, as uh, related to uh, annual events uh, when we get into the eclipse seasons and we have two solar eclipses coming up. But, you know, from ancient times, from the, when there were first human beings, people had to kind of keep track of the seasons, especially with agriculture, the planting seasons, you know, when it was, when they were going to need to take shelter and so on, and they noted the passage of, of a, a year a trip around the sun, or as they may have thought at the time, a trip that the sun took around the earth, and so on. And uh, so that went back, way back and uh, was important to agriculture and to uh, civic life. And um, oops, I may just keep pointing at the wrong, there we go, pointed that way. And, and they also noted, besides annual, that the moon's orbit could demark uh, a good, you know, a good way of dividing a year into more or less 12 equal segments, not quite, but close to it with the with the month for the lunar orbit. And they noted the passage of the shadow uh, across the Earth, uh, and actually thousands of years ago began to realize that it, it had to be spherical based on a number of things. That's not just a modern recognition, but uh, which is called the Terminator, whether it's on the Earth or on the Moon or another celestial body that, that rotates into and out of the light. And they needed to finally be able to start dividing the day up, to not only into day and night, but let's say you have to meet someone, even in, you know, at the Roman Forum or some place like that, or you have to meet someone in a little village meeting and, you know, about how the crops are going somewhere, you know, in Australia or China or somewhere. And so you had to start getting a sense of, well, at least within an hour or something of where the sun is at and what time of day we're talking about and not just day and night. And it's interesting to think about and explore, uh, as, we, as we look at time, how time and distance <clears throat> begin to be conceived of as sort of four dimensions, or at least four points, which would be needed to describe when something happened or when you would have a meeting. You would describe where you were going to be and 
oh, more or less true dimensions, unless you're on a high mountain or a ziggurat or something, uh, and, but also to know what point in time. And sometimes they would be somewhat interchangeable in many cultures, in many Native American cultures, and, uh, and ancient European cultures, they would talk about, and still to this day somewhat talk about, well, how far the way is the thing, how far are we from it in terms of a time increment? You know, is it a day's ride away? The law is a day's ride away, they say in Shane, you know. Or a half day, there's half day Illinois. And uh, even today, uh, when I worked on the railroad, I'll touch on this a couple of other times that I found time fascinating working on the railroad and timetables, that uh, uh, you uh, would find a lot of people would be saying, how, how long are, is it till we, or excuse me, how far is it? And they would actually be asking, how long is it until we get there? Uh, which is imprecise, <laughs> but I had to get adjusted to that, especially, seems like a partly generational thing that every time someone was saying, how far is it they really meant? Is it going to be a half hour yet, or an hour or something until we get there? <clears throat> And so you would, you know, you plot out trails and horseback riding and, and your trip in terms of a day's ride or, you know, three days hike or something like that. Then uh, one of the first sorts of timekeeping devices <clears throat> of a sort was sundials. But um, they, of course, were not extremely precise and didn't work so well when the sun was not out. <laughs> And when the moon was not out, you couldn't use a moon dial. But uh, not only were they uh, not as uh, precise and didn't have the, you know, didn't work when the sun was not out, but what's something else that made a sundial harder to use in terms of real time? Can someone think of why they weren't super accurate? What does the sun do? Does anybody know? Well, it doesn't move at a constant rate because of our orbit around the sun, you know, and the, the apparent rate through the sky is not always the same, so you had to make these adjustments to, to sundials too, but they go back to ancient times. So in, in uh, dividing up and measuring time, first for many, <clears throat> many centuries, it was always about something flowing, some physical thing like water or uh, sand in an hourglass. Uh, sometimes refer to uh, those devices as clepsydra, things that flow, and then later on in discrete pips, as the, some of the British call them, and in other words, time pieces, and, and then later clocks that actually had a, a discrete thing that happened, and, and, or a pulse rather than just a flow. And it's interesting in the history of the word clock that they weren't really calling them clocks for the first clocks or timepieces, you know, we now talk about a water clock or so, but they didn't, you'll, you'll find out in a minute, they didn't call them a clock until they could strike or ring because that's what that meant. I meant to bring a really great big hourglass so that I could do my impersonation of the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the water, the water uh, clocks uh, in, in China, uh, depending on the source you read, definitely over 3,000 years, perhaps as long back as 5,000 years ago, that the first of these, the simpler of these, would, you know, the flow of water from one device, and you know, from one holding, excuse me, bin into another, uh, would demarcate time. When one got filled up of a certain size, it was an hour, uh, another size would be like 15 minutes and so on. And then they refined them tremendously over the centuries so that by the time you get to somewhere near modern times, water clocks in China as well as in Italy uh, were, had all sorts of mechanical features like water wheels and cogs and so on. So they were kind of a combination of a mechanical clock and the flow of water. But then uh, there were a number of things that drove the uh, impetus to be able to, to to find time, to measure time more accurately in society. There was science, there was astronomy, often, you know, at the time interchanged with astrology in the early days, but in other words, there was finding where things were in the heavens, so you wanted to be able to measure the motion of that planet or when it would rise or so on to a much more uh, a cap, cal, uh, accurate level than just a, a quarter of an hour or something like that. So they developed instruments like astrolabes. At the same time, there was also the need for people to gather. 
And, and there were two civic areas where, uh, where being be able to define the time uh, much more accurately than a quarter an hour or an hour became important uh, to the village or the, uh, the society that you were in. One was uh, in uh, just the, the civic arena, you know, you would have the town meeting or something like that, but also prayers. In almost every religion, there was the impetus to create clots and clock towers so that you would know when to do the prayers or the monastery would know, you know, when to start having its prayers and meals and devotionals and so on. And so they, they started to uh, develop uh, clocks that had very uh, well calculated and important, important advance in technology that had repercussions all over societies. Clocks and clock towers with intricate mechanisms to, uh, to get to at least within a, a period of minutes, 15 minutes a, a day or so accuracy. And one of the reasons I show this, this is not, I believe, the same, where's my laser point? This is not the same. Um, Big center button. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. This is not the same clock face or the same mechanism as this really sort of ancient uh, church or tower. And that's one of the reasons why, although we know it took place in the 1300s, in the 1400s, they're not sure, the 14th century, the 1300s, they're not sure exactly the year of these very first clocks or the exact inventor, because almost none of them survived. So can, can you see what I'm getting at? Can someone think of why they, they didn't survive? Not because they fell apart. Any guesses? Come on, audience participation. <laughs> they, well, I'll tell you the answer. They, they updated it. So as the technology developed, they got it out and they replaced it with something else. And they didn't save, they didn't have the sense of, oh gosh, we've we got to put this in the Time Museum or something. So the originals of very few of those mechanisms exist uh, when, when they were superseded by something else. So periodic motion, periodic motion or simple harmonic motion uh, or how they started to uh, um, define more and more discrete, trying to get to smaller and smaller intervals, something like uh, a minute or even, you know, divide a minute into 60 seconds. So that you have something that oscillates like a, like a spring, uh, something on a spring or a round coiled spring, or you have something that swings back and forth like a pendulum. And the, uh, the earlier clocks that started to have more intricate mechanisms and at least, you know, got bigger on the, better on the accuracy. They had a thing called an escapement. I'll show you a detail in a moment. And some number of gears and a, a folio. Uh, so something would rock back and forth or oscillate. And, it, and the driver, you had to have a driving force, which was normally gravity. Again, sometimes uh, in the later centuries of water clocks, that was falling water too. And uh, here, here we see a bell. So, oops, a bell. So this is the beginnings of when you might start to hear the word clock used because it actually means like to strike or make a chime. So they, they didn't call the earlier time pieces clocks. So as I say, nature creates periodic motion, the orbits and so on, there's springs, there's the pendulum. And uh, you have a, a, a verge, the verge being that crown-like thing uh, so you have a verge escapement here, and then you have uh, something that oscillates back and forth, which you call the folio, so that it, uh, it alternates that one gear and the other uh, engages, and you never have them both coming free of it at the same time. Therefore, with the shape of the, of the teeth, you would alternately catch, and then slowly, or, or more quickly, it would slip away. And usually in the earlier days they were vertical and then later on horizontal. And then as I say, you got to more and more elaborate mechanisms of gears and also you start to develop some additional, oops, additional accuracy by having a spring, a coiled spring, and stopwatches, or excuse me, pocket watches actually started to get uh, to be relatively accurate, you know, to keeping to within a minute or two uh, during the course of a day in the 19th century, uh, amazing as it may seem, uh, with more, more and more carefully crafted uh, and with the spring uh, providing, you know, again, a, a more or less constant force. But the pendulum was very important and going from what before the pendulum was like 15 minutes at, you know, at best with really good machining uh, 
uh, to something that could keep time within a matter of seconds. So like a 30 to 60 fold increase in the accuracy of them. And picture this, picture Galileo being uh, kind of bored, okay. He's, he's in the cathedral and he's watching the, um, the lanterns. I don't know if they had earthquakes sometime or if a lot of wind whistled through. I forget in reading about it what was causing them to swing. If somebody remembers what was making them swing, fine, I don't know, ghosts, poltergeists. Anyway, they would swing. <laughs> and he noticed that, uh, that th the swing period was independent of the weight of the lantern or the uh, uh, chandelier or whatever, and independent of uh, the um, uh, magnitude of the swing. He started to notice that it was very closely related uh, as a function to the, just the length alone of the thing that it dangled from, whether it was a rope or a chain or whatever. So he timed that out. Now I'm going to ask you all, now you've got to get this one, because uh, uh, even jokingly I told, Dr. Schultz is going to be at the dinner if you're there, but he asked this question of us physics students. Do you know how Galileo, without having a clock, right, how did he time that swing? Counting. Pardon? Oh yes, exactly. So I mean, some say that he used his pulse uh, or some say he touched his, his chest, but either way, he, exactly. He knew that his heartbeat was pretty consistent if he didn't get up and run around the cathedral or whatever. So then even over the years, and he did the talk about being born and he slowly worked on an invention for about 30 years and he finally created one, uh, 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 you know, and, and gave it to somebody, his design to somebody to make, but he was a little bit too late because around that time, uh, in just a couple of years, Christian Huygens, the you know, great astronomer, mathematician, uh, inventor and everything, had created uh, by uh, 1750s, by 16, excuse me, 1656, a, a, uh, a pendulum uh, clock and patented it. And uh, so anyway, here's the principle again that now instead of a, uh, of a uh, verge escapement, as they call it, this we call a little bit different design, an anchor escapement, uh, because with a pendulum clock, it sort of looks like, an, it's vaguely like the upside down shape of an anchor on a ship. So that uh, was, as I say, a tremendous technological advance in the, uh, uh, in the accuracy of clocks, and then you had grandfather clocks, and it was still driven normally by, you know, because it gave a pretty constant force driving it uh, by, uh, oops, driven usually by uh, a, uh, uh, a uh, set of weights, and later on sometimes by springs, but the grandfather clock would be swinging with a pendulum. And uh, a, little bit diff a little bit better analysis of exactly how we won't belabor a lot of the mathematics, but for those of you who love equations, you know, you have the angle, you can see what the forces are involved, and on the right is the formula that the period T is equal to two pi times the square root of the length over G for the force of gravity. Um, so now, come, uh, thank you for the for the pulse and uh, for the heartbeat answer. See if you all can. If, now, don't answer if you've seen or read John Harrison's book or wonder. There's a really wonderful mini series about it called Longitude. But in the 19th century, they had a problem. You couldn't take a pendulum on a ship. Why? Waves. Exactly, it would ride back and forth so you wouldn't have, it would be, and, and if you have a huge swing too, then that approximate, that's an approximation within a good range of angles of, of what the period uh, formula is, but if you got to way up, to, you know, you have a big wave and you're swinging way up halfway to the ceiling, that doesn't work anymore. So they had a, a contest, they had a prize, and they really played it, they really uh, messed around and, and kept it away from him for years. He was, he admittedly had, had some problems with a couple of phases, a couple of uh, models of it, as they wanted it to be accurate within a second for like a, a month for the ships at sea. Uh, but he kept getting better and better and was definitely meeting, the, everybody seems to think the, the definition for how he should have received the prize. He eventually received the prize, but it wasn't by the Longitude Commission. So uh, what he did, I, I, I didn't include a picture of it, but you can read his, the book or see the video. And it's quite elaborate, a little bit like our 
telescope plot drive was, if Drew has told you about that. <laughs> Uh, with lots and lots of gears for the, uh, the second telescope that was in our observatory, a loner, before we had built our own telescope. Quite an elaborate se se selection of gears, so between his engineering and trial and error, he got it quite uh, accurately. Then we had a big additional leap in accuracy of clocks in the early uh, 20th century where you had something that oscillated and it had to be atomic level, uh, and starting out with, uh, uh, with um, uh, crystals that oscillated, a quartz crystal that oscillated a frequency of a thousand something times a second, and then later on atomic clocks, so that you're talking about oscillating between different states in an atom. It's very interesting visiting, you know, I talked about how fun it was to visit time museums and everything. If you get a chance, this was taken from a place I visited in 1977, the atomic clock that pres provides our standard of time along with there's also one at the U.S. Naval Observatory, but it's up in Boulder, Colorado. It's really fascinating to tour, and the only trouble is they won't tell you uh, what, uh, who the person was that recorded a voice that comes out on the WWV broadcast. By the way, I loved, I was so fascinated by time, but I had a girlfriend back in high school uh, who's actually, she was related to the man upstairs. Uh, no, not God, the man that's upstairs here right now. And, and she was terrified of time. She hated, she would say, Larry, turn that off. I do not want to hear those seconds play away. It's like, oh my Lord, it's, we're aging. The time is going too quickly. But I was fascinated by the sound of WWB with this, you know, with every second there'd be a click and a beat. So we then, uh, Locally, until the railroads started getting fast, locally time was measured uh, by your local position of the sun. So every village in Europe and every village in Canada and the United States, uh, even up to the very earliest days of the railroads, so they weren't much faster than the horses, and, and certainly when you're traveling by horse, uh, uh, you would just say, well, here, local noon is now, you know, if you're in like Omaha, and then you'd go like 20 miles west and you'd have a different definition. In Lincoln, Nebraska, you'd have another definition of what time of day is noon. It would be by the local uh, position of the sun. But the railroad's getting fast enough that within a day or less, you could cross a whole time zone, and especially when, if you were on a trip on the railroad that crossed, even if it's for a few days, more than one time zone, that got to be very, very tedious. So they were the impetus, the railroads were between the creation of something called standard time, and we, they created the time zones in 1883 by the Standard Time Act. And I know working on the railroad that the timetables, you know, it was very important for them to know, especially before radio communication, you know, when is that train gonna come through? We have to get off onto a siding, siding to let that express train come through. And incidentally, a really strange thing about, a really weird thing about the develop, the uh, evolution of timetables on the railroads, I know from working with them for seven years, is that today, because they, other than passenger trains, they usually don't try to run a freight train at a specific time, because they can just use GPS and find whatnot and find out where it is. So when you open up what's often still called a timetable, it has track layouts, it has track rules, it has the exact wording you have to repeat back and forth three times about getting a track authority, but it does not have a timetable. Uh, so they divided the United States into Pacific, Mountain, Central, and Eastern, and eventually the whole world got more or less on board with this, although there are ports of, parts of Europe and, the, and uh, Russia that have awfully big uh, in China, excuse me, not Europe, parts of Asia, Russia, China especially, <clears throat> that have some really, really big time zones where you go quite a long distance and the time zone doesn't change. So we'll speak only but little of <clears throat> rate of time uh, in, uh, uh, in um, the big picture of, like I say, during the course of the year and especially about the calendar, but it is important to note a distinction between solar time, um, you know, what your local moon is, and you can, you can look that up, you know, uh, on tables and whatnot today. And Greenwich, Greenwich mean time became more important over, time, over a period uh, with astronomy because they needed to make it simpler than talking about, well, what time zone are we talking about now? What time zone are we talking about? Especially right on the verge between the two time zones, 
uh, we had this problem on the on the railroads too. Is which which one are they referring to? Uh, are we talking about your Eastern Time or Central Time? So instead, you would use Greenwich Mean Time or a slight variation of it called Coordinated Universal Time. And so the Sun's time uh, differs from uh, the star time because as we go around the Sun, you know the the sidereal time measures when when a given star or you know or object in the in the sky beyond the solar system uh, crosses the meridian. Uh, uh, you know, the next day, and, and it differs from day to day by about four minutes from solar time. Uh, and time, uh, we talked about look back time, and we won't dwell on that a lot, uh, as uh, uh, um, Ron alluded to, that yes, when you look back, as I talked about too in my uh, discussion, of distance scales, that when you're looking at vast distances, you know, uh, uh, beyond the solar system, light years, and then even into the millions of light years, you're effectively seeing something that happened uh, many years before. Uh, you're not really traveling in time, though, because it's just the light that's been traveling, and it has a finite speed. But uh, you are looking, looking at something that's an image from back in time. And when I was working at UPS, we, our maps were almost like look back time, because we would have a map that, again, was zoned a little bit like back in the days of the horses, except everything moved faster, where it would be, it would be colored in or zoned or have numbers on it for how many days away of ground travel are you. So again, it's sort of a mixing of the, uh, of the coordinates of physical, of um, spatial coordinates with time coordinates. But then they needed to be able, people needed to be able to, and had a fascination over the eons with breaking time into smaller and smaller bits. You know, what is the smallest amount of time we can perceive, and can we push it beyond that? And is there a, like, finite, is there a limit where time doesn't mean anything beyond that smallest fraction? So uh, they, they created things um, in early animation, like uh, the uh, movement of a horse, a galloping horse, by a clever series of cameras, or you would more typically, a little past this, these early days of, of sort of motion picture, you would have a strobe. Uh, in other words, later on it would be a strobe light flashing for a very short period of time, but earlier on it would be a rotating wheel with little holes in it that would let, you know, or a rotating shutter on the camera uh, that would be able to take a frame that's a tiny, tiny, fr and smaller and smaller fraction of a second. And Edgerton, uh, 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 did it, this in the studio with, you know, uh, all sorts of tricks of, of, of uh, flashes and so on, uh, breaking time, again, into ever and ever smaller bits, trying to freeze it to where you could actually see a bullet crossing through a card, that sort of thing. And which is in interesting that there's, you know, there's the king of hearts, because we'll get into that in a second, too, of uh, perceptions of time and Alice in Wonderland. But so a fraction of a second, a tenth of a second is about the most, the littlest that we can perceive, and there's a persistence of vision anyway in, in our brains to where uh, you can, you have an after image. So that's why m movies or something that changes, even a video that changes frames frequently, uh, you want to have it at least as short as like, shorter than a tenth of a second, so you don't perceive that flash. Then you get to milliseconds, even short a thousandth of a second, microseconds, a millionth of a second, nanoseconds, a billionth of a second, femtoseconds, a quadrillionth of a second, and then um, uh, uh, sextillionth of a second. Now, uh, uh, somewhere between femtosecond and a quad, uh, sextillionth, by the way, is something that they used to call uh, the shortest time of, uh, uh, observe or measurable. And uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, or Schultz uh, erroneously said that it was the sh increment of time, he was pretty close, but the increment of time that it takes for light to cross the nucleus, but it's actually, which is more like a septillion, but it's actually the, the unit of time that it takes for light to cross about the width of a virus, still a very, very short period of time. So then, uh, over time, as I say, there were, you know, you had to mention like four coordinates. So time began to think, be think, thought of more and more as sort of a fourth dimension beyond the spatial dimensions. H.G. Wells makes reference to this, of course, 
as, as you see in a, a number of my slides here, of, of time travel science fiction. And then uh, relativity um, looks at, uh, uh, it, by the way, Newton actually had a form of relativity too. It's just that you know he recognized in certain frames of reference that time could, uh, could flow differently and in certain media. However, uh, he didn't have it refined to the degree that Einstein discovered later on that even when you're not accelerating, when you approach the speed of light, uh, time still slows down anyway. Uh, we'll skip through that a little bit. Okay, absolute or relative time. So Newton had said, and I have to look for this quote here because I don't have it memorized. Newton had said that uh, absolute true and mechanical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. So there is sort of an example, or a sense of, of a, the reality of time, the time is something discrete, and time is something independent of the observer, something that uh, quantum mechanics and relativity began to see is not exactly true either. Uh, we, and then we have the, uh, the arrow of time, and we'll look at Carlo Rovelli and phi phenomena in a little bit. So it, entro, entropy is a way of defining, because um, time has often been defined as that something moves through a distance. So you can measure the fact that it's not in the same place as it was. But as we all know, even if you do sit in one place in your chair for uh, a year or something, you definitely decay. <laughs> so time still passes. There is still something that's happened, even if you don't move. Uh, so your molecules and things in your cells do. So uh, 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 Ludwig Boltzmann and uh, the thermodynamics uh, uh, theories of the late 19th, early 20th century developed this idea of entropy, that the prob probability of a disordered state is not only less, but can actually be made in an equation that's, that it's relation, it's relation to the disorder of the state. So the more disordered the state, the more probable it is. So that's a sense that we have time moving along. Uh, and that, um, uh, but that things may, may sometimes return to an original state. Some things may loop around, but there is this definite, uh, likelihood or flow seemed to be a flow to many people at that time from the past into the present and into the future. There was also the idea, of course, in the early 20th century, throughout developing throughout the 20th century of a beginning of time, at least time that we can measure and before which we can't, we can't measure because it was like a, a, a turning point in the evolution of the universe. And there's the, the nature of, of uh, <coughs> the nature of evolution, I'll just touch on that briefly, that people often ask, well, how does that work? Because it goes against entropy. Well, uh, Jacob Bernowski and some of the other people that, uh, that studied evolution uh, in the 20th century talked about a thing, a concept called stratified stability. But in other words, sort of like if you were jumping upwards a little bit at a time and you know jumping your way, from one level in a high building to another, you know, you're, you're in each place you're at a slightly more ordered or you know a slightly more potential energy place or you know a, against the flow of entropy. But so evolution would have a, a, a random change every now and then cause an organism to go to a place of, of stability and stay there for a while. Then maybe another change would come along, and you would do that incrementally and create stratified stability. Now, things like the Big Bang, that gets into the idea of a beginning. Because uh, as uh, Sandage and some others have said in lectures I've heard, it can be equally troubling to people. I think Hawking said this too. It can be equally troubling to people, the idea that time would have a beginning somewhere billions of years ago. Because then the question is, well, what before that? You know, or was there some? And then also the, the concept, though, of there being no beginning of just that, you know, some, some of the, uh, uh, like Hindu philosophy and so on, and some of the uh, scientists who look at the possibility that maybe the universe goes through cycles. Well, there might not have ever been a beginning. It might just, you know, go on forever and have been existed forever. But each can be slightly uh, troubling. So here is uh, Boltzmann. <coughs> 
And uh, perceptions of time. Now, if you remember Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, Alice met with the Red Queen, and, and they made some music, and, and uh, she said, he's murdering the time. So it's, of course, that was like a sort of multifaceted pun that uh, not only can time seem to be moved around and, and uh, a beat syncopated, but if you don't get it right, you've murdered the time. In other words, you've ruined the time signature of the uh, event, but it also goes to our, our perceptions of how time passes more slowly and more quickly over just a, a lifetime, even just a few years. Even the younger folks among us in the audience may have noticed that, as I did, that when I was even 15 or 12, somewhere, that I could perceive a year as being what seemed to go much faster than the length of time that a year took. It's, I perceived a year as going much slower at age five or six. And we get this perception uh, uh, continuing to alter as we get older and until it seems like a year just flies by. And is there any reality to that or not? And then there's, you know, as, as alluded to in science fiction and, and uh, philosophy, does a watch pot ever boil? Uh, it, uh, it, if you're waiting for something to happen, you're waiting for the news of the test you took or the, you know, that it seems to go on forever. The same hour is in eternity. If you're talking about watching the total solar eclipse and it's four minutes, it seems like it, it went by in like 15 seconds. Now, time zero. No, not that time zero. Not the one we saw in Star Trek The Next Generation. But the arrow, the idea that of necessity, we don't seem to be able to go back in time. <clears throat> so why is that? And it's not completely immutable, but certainly it seems to have some uh, uh, basis in reality. But often in the same conversation or the same paragraph, people will talk about not only that time has a, a di direction, you know, okay, like, sort of like a vector has a direction, it may not be the same size all the time because you know, as you know, uh, uh, we, we talked uh, for a moment about relativity. Einstein discovered that, uh, you know, when he had that thought experiment, it didn't go on quite as long as, uh, uh, as Galileo's with the uh, pendulum. But anyway, over a period of a few months, he was like, what if I got on a, uh, uh, a trolley and I was near the speed of light, and the experiments that have been done recently, uh, Maxwell and the Michelson-Morley experiment, uh, showed that light seems to have the same speed, unless you're passing it through solids or liquid or whatever, but in a vacuum it has the same speed all the time, regardless of your motion. So how can that be? How come the motions don't add up or subtract? Uh, so it's because the time dilates or the time shortens. Uh, so the arrow may have like kind of a different magnitude, but it always seems to flow towards the uh, future and we don't seem to be able to go back in time. But uh, is it really a flow, as they would describe in the early time pieces? And there's still a question about that amongst the philosophers and amongst the, um, amongst the science fiction writers and amongst the uh, 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 scientists, the cosmologists and astrophysicists as to whether it actually has a flow or not, or it exists independent of, of events that happen. So then, of course, you had, you had H.G. Wells, you had the time machine, which, by the way, uh, I was trying to find a picture of it. I had one at one point that I lost it. That uh, I love the way uh, the time machine 1960 movie was a huge influence, George Pals, you know, on, uh, on Zemeckis' Back to the Future, you know, of the things they considered about can you alter something. They only went into the future in the time machine. They went into the past and the future in the series from from Back to the Future, but they, they admit that they had a lot of influence from this movie in making the uh, Back to the Future series. And at one point, uh, the um, cast of Back to the Future got to visit the original props that were used, and it was fun watching them sit in the time machine from the 1960 film. So Einstein was troubled by these ideas of altering around time, just like he was troubled by the expansion of the universe. He thought, you know, he would say things like, God does not play dice. And, and so when he was seeing that um, there might possibly be something like going back in time or bridging the gap between different, different areas in space and time, like it's a, you know, it's a fabric. He didn't have any problem with that. General relativity, 
broaden that out to that the gravity creates sort of a well around a, a, a body with mass. And so, you know, time could be altered that way too. Uh, but that he was troubled by the idea of being able to flip back to some other point in time. Uh, but still, he and Rosen talked about, you know, a bridge possibly between different parts of the universe or different places in time. And so they created the idea uh, which, which Kip Thorne, at the request of Carl Sagan for his book and movie, Contact, and I got to meet both of them and talk to them a little bit about this at uh, Fermilab, in the case of Carl Sagan, and Kip Thorne talked to us at, at the ASB, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific Convention. So interesting how he developed the concepts uh, uh, through uh, and to show the, the science behind them between black holes and white holes and tunnels through hyperspace. So here's you know this concept of an Einstein-Rosen bridge that you, you, you fold, and they talk about this in the 1960s, because this was after Einstein-Rosen bridges were posited. They talk about this in the 1960 movie, a little bit differently even than in H.G. Wells' novel, that you could fold space over, and, and you know, or the space-time fabric over, and be able to short circuit uh, a huge gap in space or a huge gap in time, also explored, of course, in contact. And I think rather brilliantly in interstellar, and, and most uh, cosmologists and astrophysicists that I've talked to about it, and, uh, and uh, friends in the, from the early days of the Astronomy Club, they really think it's, a, it's one of the better science fiction novels, but that it, it, it uses devices like a, a so-called tesseract that first appears in, in the book the, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle that uh, uh, you would be using this five-dimensional construction that, uh, so that you would be able to uh, sort of step outside of both the three dimensions of space and the possibly posited fourth dimension of, of time. Now, there's paradoxes, again, that, that trouble Einstein and others and the, and the filmmakers and the science fiction authors so how do we do deal with the paradox that was talked about, you know, that Doc talked about in, in Back to the Future, uh, and still have all these physical laws work, and yet be able possibly to move through time, which at least a, a black hole uh, that's rotating or a wormhole seem to indicate may be possible. So there's possible ways around the paradoxes. One, that it may be, uh, but they don't explain really, how there is this barrier that keeps you from doing this, but that you can't go back before the time of the invention of the time machine. So that, for example, in the old really quirky way of putting it, you know, it sounds so violent and everything, that you would go back and kill your mother so you would never be born. Well, if you killed your mother and you'd never be born, how could you live to invent the time machine? So one possible solution, you can't get, go back to before the time machine was built. And other, another uh, solution posited in uh, in Back to the Future and some of the others, that, that you create alternate timelines and the, and the time machine. Alternate timelines that branch off so, you know, so you can't necessarily jump between the timelines unless maybe you go back to when the jump occurred, but you can create more than one pathway that time takes. Or you could, there could be alternate realities and Sandage and, and Kip Thorne and some of the others at the ASP direction, uh, convention talked some about this idea that that there would be brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, or parallel universes, and that, that theoretically even could be, exist for every single decision we make, that it could have an alternate reality that, that comes to pass. In very recent times, there's a, a, a man named uh, Carlos Ravelli, and he has a, a great book, uh, among several others, he's got a bunch of uh, books he's authored, called The Order of Time, which delves into this question, is time even real? And he and some of the other cosmologists and astrophysicists have said, well, it's probably not a flow, that in some ways that's an illusion, just like you know, this wave nature of, of matter or wave nature of light is not an entirely accurate picture of things at the quantum, at the very tiny, tiny level, the atomic, the nuclear level, <clears throat> that, it's some, that time doesn't just flow, that it has to be some kind of discrete bits that keep going to a certain point and then, you know, the, the bits don't get smaller than that, that there's like a, a quantum of time, so to speak. And also that, in de, that independent of events, time does not exist. In other words, if you didn't have something that, and, and your very observation of a thing alters it, but if you didn't have something happen, then 
you know, there is no other way just in the, completely by itself as an absolute time to describe that on this day such and such occurred, even though nothing occurred, you know. There isn't a, like nothingness in time day. If you didn't break something or a star wasn't born or whatever that day, uh, there, there wasn't time for all intents and purposes. It's a little hard to wrap your head around. I would recommend reading it, and I think you could, you could say to some degree it boils down to, you know, even though it's very limited how we could experience going back in time, like if you have to you have this huge amount of energy to create a white hole or a wormhole or something, uh, but that uh, there's some evidence of like spooky things happening at a distance, that there's certain, uh, you know, uh, entangled particles that uh, are able to communicate sort of communicate a change to another particle somewhere way across the universe instantaneously, and that some events, according to the quantum uh, 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 theorists, seem to look like they are flowing a different direction depending on who the observer is. I may see it as forward, they may see it as backwards. And so that, to an extent, what we're looking at is just the probabilities. That in other words, uh, this is much, much, much more probable that I will actually fall, you know, to, to hit the ground when I jump off the building, than that something, it's not impossible, but the, the, the probability is vanishingly small that I will, like, go up and we can reverse that thing. They used to say when I was younger and we had movies and you could, I loved the way they could, and we would make the, the projectionist, I was a projectionist sometimes, and the kids would say, please run the thing backwards. So the, the, the definition of entropy, you know, is that you are defying it when you run the thing the other way and people laugh. <laughs> In other words, some things can reverse, you know, a car can reverse, a horse can even back up, but the things that shattered, getting back into, from pieces into a hole, or the person, you know, having all the water dry off instantaneously, that is not reversible. So that's a lot of what we perceive when we perceive a flow or an arrow of time. So I've talked about those things, and uh, I will just close by saying that, um, as they said, and it's a wonderful film if you haven't seen it, there's other versions, but I think the best was in the 1960 George Pell, at the last line of The Time Machine, Philby, who was played by Alan Young, you know, the, Mr. Ed, uh, the fellow that, that uh, took care of Mr. Ed, is, is saying to the time traveler, uh, played by Rod Stewart, is saying about them, him, excuse me, just after he's departed, and someone in the household says, well, what will he do? And she says, one can but wonder. You see, he has all the time in the world. <laughs> so thank you, that's it. It doesn't even have to be a question because it, oftentimes these bring, you know, meandering thoughts about the nature of time or something. And it's something that someone wants to expound on for just a minute or two, otherwise we'll be over time. <laughs> yeah. I've seen uh, where they have speculation, does the past still exist? Ah, exactly. That's one of the areas that, you know, if I... Uh, had arranged the time a little bit differently, that yes, that exactly the same folks like uh, uh, Ravelli that believe that time is something of an illusion, you know, even though we obviously can't easily reverse the arrow, but we'll, are saying that past, present, and future are all here at the same time, which sort of makes sense because, you know, you, you, if you have a four-dimensional space-time continuum, otherwise where did it go, you know, uh, is a great book and a great movie, but the Langoliers, you know, where Stephen King has these little creatures that eat the time away so the, the past doesn't exist anymore, that doesn't seem to make much sense, although it's a fun movie, that yes, that past, present, and future are still together at the same time, and that we may even have some, even in our macro sense of our huge, you know, not uh, quantum size, that we may sometimes latch on to a few thoughts or perceptions of something in the future or in the past, explored very beautifully in the book, uh, in the book Childhood Zen by Arthur C. Clarke, where it turns out, I won't give anything away, uh, any spoilers, but that things that we perceived as a, like a species or, or a civilization for thousands of years that we thought were in the past were actually the echo that comes all the way around full circle of something that would happen in humanity's future. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, yeah. 
what's the state of the art as far as the atomic clocks? How accurate are they, and how how short of an interval can they proceed? I don't recall the exact figure of a very, very small fragment of a second, uh, you know, in the nanoseconds or something like that. And, and indeed, you know, you have, you have computing that can take place, uh, too, in that, those sorts of time frames. And you know, one of the ways that you can tell how, that it's a very, very tiny fraction of, you know, in 10 to the minus, that may, not maybe a uh, um, uh, uh, femtosecond, or you're not, you know, maybe not as accurate as, as like, uh, can be conceived of the life traveling across a, a, a virus or something, but very, very tiny, you know, uh, trillionth of a second or whatever. One of the ways that we know that it's super accurate is that they look at how the Earth has, is ever so slowly rotating in a longer period, and because they can measure that, they can, um, every now and then add a leap second to a year. Not every year, but every now and then they will add a leap second. So if you calculate that out in the math, in the arithmetic of it, you can see that they've gone into a very, very tiny, you know, billionth of a second or whatever to know that over a period of a few years, we've gained a second. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Yeah, I got one. Uh Downtown Chicago, I don't know if you're familiar with the Continental Bank building. Yes, I know what you're... Okay, that's where Standard Time Zone, it says Chicago played a pivotal part being the site of the 1883 General Time Convention. The convention adopted Standard Time with four time zones, each offset by an exact number of hours from English Standard Time. This began a slow worldwide conversion to time zones based on the Greenwich Meridian. Right. And there's a plaque on that building even today. Yes. Yes, Mark. Larry, you might want to elaborate on the backstory behind longitude. What what problem they were trying to solve and why the clock was the solution. Well, they had, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I went a little bit too fast on that. As it says, the name is longitude, as they used to pronounce it back then. Now we mostly say it with a hard G of longitude. But longitude, uh, it was important to, and by the way, on the, on the Canberra, myself and a famous astronomer, we won't go into that. But anyway, we're taking these lessons on the Canberra, on the African eclipse cruise, in uh, uh, finding you're, you know, in, in, uh, in navigation by the sun and celestial navigation. And it, it's relatively easy to get latitude because, you know, you, you can measure the distance that, you know, uh, something like the North Star or a number of other bodies are from the horizon and get your latitude quite easily that way. But the harder part was getting longitude or longitude, which they had to know, they had to know, you know, how much provisions, how close were they, did they have to catch some more fish or something, where were they east to west, that, you know, where were they going to catch the winds, and you can't know, and I remember this one guy arguing back and forth on the Canberra when we were taking the lessons, like, and it wasn't making any sense, but we had trouble getting across to him that if you don't know the time, you don't know how to take this position of the sun at noon, say, and fix the longitude. So you had to know two different things, the position of a body like the sun at sunrise or noon, and your, on what time it is relative to some other place. So in order to keep the time running very precisely, they had to know literally, you know, if they want to know within a couple of miles, you're talking about a couple of seconds of arc, you know, on the, uh, uh, on the globe. Uh, and then, as I said uh, earlier, back then, that uh, you couldn't do it with a pendulum clock because the pendulum would go all, all wild. Uh, so you had to have a clock that, independent of a pendulum, which had already gone down to, you know, a, a second uh, or so in, a, in several weeks in accuracy, that independent of a pendulum, would do what all those other mechanical clocks for centuries never could do, which is, you know, break the minute mark or the three minute mark and go down to a second of, of, uh, of precision um, by the mechanical train of gears and, and so on. So it was quite a project. It took a lot of engineering and quite a, a, a prize. And they really, they were unfair and nasty in denying it to, uh, 
uh, to poor Harrison for years. Uh, he, he kept getting better and better at it. He had some false starts in like the middle 10, 15 years. He was working on it for decades, but finally he more, pretty much perfected that uh, even in the era, era before uh, before uh, um, uh, cesium clocks and you know and uh, uh, and uh, crystals oscillating and so on. I think I'm done. We're running out of time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.